So Dr. Richard Harris, who likes to be called Harry, a cave diver, anaesthetist, and in June 2018, with your good friend and fellow cave diver Craig Challen, mounted a rescue of a group of teenage soccer players in an underwater cave in Thailand. And the successful rescue of those boys became an international media sensation and you and Craig were awarded the Joint Australians of the Year. So welcome, Harry. Welcome to this discussion. Hi, Sophie. Nice to be here. So let's get straight into it to talk about cave diving. What drew you to the sport of cave diving? Was it feelings of adrenaline or a spirit of adventure? Uh, definitely the adventure side of things. It's not really an adrenaline seekers sport. In fact, we go out of our way to avoid adrenaline because that usually things uh, means things are going a little bit wrong. It's a bit like anesthesia actually, kind of 99% boredom and 1% terror on those, those bad days. So uh, I quite like the analogies between the, the sport and the occupation for me. So I, I like cave diving because I find it quite meditative, quite um, serene. The environment's, you know, beautiful and pristine and uh, crystal clear water, really lots of interesting stuff to see. But the real draw card for me is the exploration. It's really the last place on this planet that you can go and genuinely see something or find something for yourself that no human beings ever, ever witnessed. And that's actually really addictive when you first walk or swim into a tunnel that no one has ever visited before. It's, it's tremendous. So when you got the call uh, to come and help out in the rescue of these, the Thai soccer boys, how likely did you think it would be that you and the other divers would be able to get the boys out safely? Oh, I, I was appalled at, at what we were facing, you know, in this rescue. I really didn't give the plan any chance of success at all. Um, you know, the idea of, of getting these boys from over two and a half kilometres at the back of this cave, of which most of which was flooded with water and, and over a kilometre was fully submerged. So they would have to dive to come out somehow. And lots of different plans were, were considered in, in terms of how to get them out, including teaching them to dive or, or waiting for the water to go down, all these sorts of things. But the pressure of time, because the, the monsoons were really on their way, meant that that really forced our hand and we had to try this, this crazy plan of anaesthetizing the boys and, and diving them out. And uh, for a variety of reasons, I thought that was truly doomed to, to fail. But, you know, we had to try something. So you mentioned you had to sedate the, the kids to get them out, but what other measures did you need to take to be able to get them out of there safely? Well, once we decided that the sedation plan was the only way, then we had to you know, consider how could we possibly render someone unconscious with an anaesthetic and then dive them out of the cave. And you know, to a, the, the idea of immersing someone underwater in the anaesthetized state is quite preposterous. So. Uh, you don't have to be an anaesthetist or a, or a diver to, to think that through. So there were three major concerns for me. One was the obvious one of how to protect their airway while they were underwater. And to get around that, we used a, a full face mask. So instead of just a, you know, a half mask that a, a diver would normally use, we used a mask that went all the way around their forehead, right, right around underneath their chin. So their airway was protected. But we had done some testing with these sort of masks in um, some training that we've done around uh, cave rescue and in, inevitably we've found that it's not completely effective at keeping the water out and unless the diver participates and, and actively you know keeps those last few drops of water out then then it will slowly fill up so I was very concerned that that part of the plan would fail. Uh, the other issues were around the airway itself you know anyone who's unconscious is very prone to obstructing their airway and I wasn't going to be able to escort each of these boys out and look after their airway. So I had to hand off their airway, if you like, to these, to these other divers who weren't medically trained. And the final concern was around um, their body temperature. You know, the water was only 23 degrees and anesthesia tends to, you know, lower your, your core temperature quite dramatically. So I was very concerned that after, you know, two or three hours in the water, these boys would, would perish from hypothermia. So you know, it really seemed like the odds were against success. And you also tell us about there were some other measures with the boys that you needed to take so that they wouldn't, if they did wake up, they wouldn't, they wouldn't um, flail around to, if they happened to, you know, by chance come out of the anaesthetic. Yeah, this is something that got into the media at one stage and, um, you know, maybe the slightly um, uh, controversial part of this rescue, we, we actually ended up binding the boys' hands behind their back and tying their feet together. 
And the idea of that was to make them as streamlined as possible so that we could move them quickly and, and smoothly through the cave so that their limbs wouldn't get entangled or injured on the way out. But also so that if they did suddenly wake up from the anaesthetic that they wouldn't panic and, and reach up and pull their own face mask off or more importantly, disable the rescue diver. So it's hard to explain how you know morally compromised I felt having you know, given a kid an anaesthetic, dressed him in this gear, um, pushed him underwater and, in the unconscious state and then tied his hands behind his back. It, that for me, this was probably the most challenging part of the whole experience. Yeah, so how confronting was that for you when you had to do that? Well, you, you know, the actual anaesthesia and the diving itself, I kind of took in my stride, but it was these moral questions that the, were the big issue for me. Uh, I'm lucky to have worked in some fairly austere environments, um, you know, resource poor places like Vanuatu, where I worked for a couple of years as an Aussie anaesthetist. And, you know, places like that, you're used to cobbling things together to find solutions to, to do the best you can uh, for your patients. Um, working with the retrieval service with South Australian Ambulance uh, for, for quite a few years. Again, the same thing, you know, working in small teams at the roadside or in small country hospitals with very sick patients. I really enjoy that sort of medicine. Um, so that in and of itself wasn't a big deal. It was the, these issues around, you know, am I actually doing the right thing for these boys that, that really tested me? And I did feel like I might be euthanizing these kids at one stage, but really the options uh, were so limited and the time frame so, um, so pushed that we had to crack on and just do what we could give it a go so you mentioned other types of medicine but psychologically what was it in your medical training or your experience that prepared you for that experience or allowed you to uh, take part in that experience look i think people self-select a little bit for the type of medical work that they do and perhaps the sort of things they do outside of medicine i guess as a, a long time adventurer and cave diver, someone who's always enjoyed testing myself out in the bush and, and challenging myself throughout my life, whether it's outside of work or within work. Um, I, in a way, I go out of my way to, to find these sort of experiences and they don't obviously appeal to everyone to do the sorts of things that I do. But I think you find a lot of people in emergency or critical care medicine have that characteristic that they seek challenges in their, in their day um to, to test themselves and to get outside their comfort zone it must have been extremely stressful for you going through that experience how did you manage the stress that you were experiencing during that rescue i almost didn't have a chance to manage the stress during those four days i mean we were in the cave for nearly 12 hours a day coming out to uh, you know a frantic site i mean there were thousands of people there and we were straight into meetings and debriefs uh, to try and you know explain to the to the locals what we'd been doing and how things were going, and then back to the hotel by one or two in the morning for a few hours sleep before we were back into it the next day. So I would say I actually didn't get a chance to do that until after the the rescue, and then you know that was the time to take a deep breath and and think about what we'd just achieved. But you know it was just head down and bum up and and into it really. There was no time to think about it too much. You were pessimistic of the mission. But how are you able to transform your mindset from pessimism going in to a, a realistic optimism that you might succeed? I think realistic optimism was probably uh, too strong a word. I just resolved myself to doing the best that we could. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I felt that what I was embarking on was almost certain to end in the deaths of some or all of these boys. But you know, people have asked, well, why or how could you possibly proceed if you genuinely felt that way? And the answer to that was that the alternatives were actually worse. And, you know, what could be worse than taking the lives of these boys? Well, the way I justified it to myself was that if the boys died, then they would be asleep when, they ha when that happened. But if I walked away, they would be uh, doomed to, uh, you know, slowly perishing from starvation, infection, exposure over the coming weeks. And, you know, what a lonely and horrible death. And I, I couldn't walk away from, from that possibility. So, you know, if there was even a sliver of a chance, 
then we just had to give it a try. And the other thing was the whole team was on board with this idea. So I felt like I was well supported, even though they realised that ultimately I would be the one who would feel responsible for these kids' deaths. But I couldn't walk away from the team any more than I could walk away from these boys. Did you think about the potential cost to your reputation or even ending up in a Thai jail if things didn't work out um, well? Look, I didn't really think about these things. Maybe I'm not very smart or I'm a bit naive, but it was pointed out to me by uh, two very clever people. Uh, the first being my wife, who who did mention the you know what have a think about what this will do to my career, my reputation if I become known as the you know Doctor Death of, of Thailand. And look, the media is generally fair and kind, but there's no question in my mind that had these boys died, then that would have been the outcome for me. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not so foolish. Imagine that, um, you know, being being the, the hero of the day comes easily, but being the villain comes much more quickly and lasts a lot longer, I'm sure. Uh, so there's that. But um, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, chaps who are with us did also point out that there was potential to end up in the Thai judicial system if, if something went wrong with these boys. And that was actually mentioned to us on the very morning that we were walking into the cave to perform the first day's rescue. And I pretty much couldn't you know, deal with that information at that very point in time. So I just said, look, the Australian government will have to look after us and get us out of Thailand if there's an issue. And I really haven't got time to think about that right now, but they did get us diplomatic immunity by the next day. So we were covered for the second half of the rescue. So doctors, as you know, have to make often make quick decisions in a crisis situation. Um, what do you think were the psychological skills and tools that helped you make those quick decisions in a, in a critical situation like this one? I think a lot of it's down to training and practice, you know, doing uh, scenario training, we do quite a lot in, in critical care medicine is very valuable for when the real thing arises. And even mentally rehearsing what you will do in certain situations is very important. I can remember um, when I was a, a, a very junior anaesthetic SHO in the UK, in 1992 and the cardiac arrest beeper went off and I went running through the hospital uh, to the cardiac arrest, one of the first ones I'd attended. And the nurse pointed into the bathroom where the patient had uh, keeled over on the toilet. And as I ran into the, into the bathroom, uh, I slipped on a large uh, brown object on the floor and fell right amongst it. And at that point in time, I, I learned a valuable lesson for the rest of my career that, uh, you know, uh, more speed and less haste is often a very good idea in these sort of situations. There's always time to, to think and plan. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, so there's always plenty of opportunities in medicine to make a complete fool of yourself and to think about how to do things better next time. So in, the, in that extraordinary situation with the cave rescue, what do you think that you learned about yourself through that experience? Well, obviously, I was very proud of what we as a team uh, achieved in that rescue. And I don't think I learned anything new about myself. I mean, as I said at the start, you know, I have gone out of my way to engage in these kind of um, situations in, in life in and out of medicine. And it just confirmed to me that, you know, a lifetime of experience and preparation can sometimes culminate in an event that you would never have planned for or expected, but it's never too early to start to, you know, test yourself and, and prepare for life's adversities. And um, so I'd like to think that all of my life experience was of great value on those few days. So Harry, you were dealing not only with the rescue of the boys, but you had a personal um, tragedy unfolding as well with your, your dad passing away. What helped you cope with, with having both those situations to deal with at the same time? Yeah, it was pretty bad timing. I mean, I was uh, fairly fraught from, you know, many days of little sleep and dealing with this, you know, life or death crisis in Thailand. And then to hear my father had died um, was, a, was a pretty major blow. But I think I got through it knowing that um, dad's death was a really good one. Uh, he was he had just gone into a nursing home, which he was unhappy about. 
he had recently had a cancer diagnosis, which really looked to promise a fairly unpleasant end for him. So when I heard that he had really popped his clogs in the nursing home and had a fairly graceful exit, that actually um, made me feel a lot better about the whole situation. And, you know, we all get born, we're all going to die. The best you can hope for is, um, I think this might be a song lyric, the best you can hope for is to die in your sleep. So, yeah. you know, I, you can't be happier than for someone you love to, to have that sort of exit. So uh, after 24 hours of wallowing in my own misery, I started to see the, you know, the good side of all these outcomes. And actually it was an amazing few days thereafter. I stayed in Thailand with the team and uh, we did a fair bit of bonding as you can imagine and uh, relaxing so it was actually an amazing few days and i really celebrated dad's life in those few days as well as the success of the mission oh that's lovely now talking about uh, success after after this amazing experience you and craig were named the joint australians of the year it was, I think that was the first time they've ever named two two as australian of the year i think um, what, what did that mean to you? Uh, well, it was an enormous shock, as, I, as I'm sure it is for any person who's, who's, who's named with that award. And initially, I was acutely embarrassed by the whole thing. I felt like it was very much undeserved, and, and Craig shared this, this sentiment. You know, we felt like we were doing something um, that, A, we enjoy, you know, going doing a cave diving rescue. We've been training for this for many years. So it almost seemed like a, a dream come true to, to put this practice and training into, into effect. And I think you find anyone in the emergency services would, would share that sentiment that they, you know, they look forward to putting the training into use to try and help people. Um, obviously it turned out to be a little bit more chaotic and, and frightening than we could have expected, but nonetheless, we did go there with a sense of anticipation perhaps. Um, and also we were just doing our job. I mean, we, you know, I work as an anaesthetist to work in this sort of field of medicine. And for me, it did feel uh, going to work, although albeit in a, in a strange environment. And there are so many people that, you know, do these sort of things. But anyway, regardless of that, it happened. And um, after the initial shock and, and horror, um, I really decided that to prove to myself, if if no one else, that you know we were worthy recipients of this, then I would do what I could during that that twelve months to to earn my stripes, if you like, and um, you know really committed to to doing some things that I you know to give back a little bit. When you were named Australian of the Year with Craig, what was your mission for and your message that you wanted to spread that year? What was the the, the message you were hoping to get out to as many people as possible? Yeah, very much some of the stuff we've already alluded to, Sophie. I, I really wanted to inspire kids in particular, but then it did broaden into, you know, the general population just to get out and, and do things that, that challenge yourself. And, you know, I think that the more things you can do, whether it be through outdoor adventuring, as it has been in my case, or or, or other pursuits that, that are difficult or, or scary or challenging, uncomfortable, you know, the more things like that you can do and the more life experience you get like that, the better prepared you will be for challenges, whether they're work challenges or, or health challenges, which might be coming or relationship issues. You know, we all will face adversity at different times of our, in our life. And for some people, it will be very major adversity. So the more robust you are and the better prepared you are, I think the better prepared uh, you'll be. So, you know, I, I've been talking to a lot of kids, um, getting involved with some kids charities in particular. Um, trying to get kids off their screens and getting outside and, and uh, in particular outdoor adventuring, which is my particular interest. But, you know, whether it's uh, playing an instrument or reading more books or whatever whatever they can do just to broaden their horizons a bit. What advice have for doctors about the importance of having interests outside medicine and outside their, their sort of day-to-day -day work? Yeah, I think... All, all doctors are different and all specialties are different. You know, we need people who are uh, buried in the laboratory finding cures for this and that. We need deep thinking psychiatrists and we need, uh, you know, strong personalities with, with decent egos, uh, like some surgeons to be able to, you know, have the courage to, to cut people open and, and back themselves in those situations. So we're also different, but I'm sure that, um, all, all doctors can benefit from having, you know, some balance in their life and not being 
you know, 110% committed to their work, but find some time for out, outside activities outside of medicine uh, to make them a better rounded person, to, to make sure they've got time to look after themselves and their families. And also so that they can relate a little bit better to some of their patients. I mean, if, you, if you've only ever been to school, to medical school, and then continued with your, your medical training, you know, you may struggle to understand what, what some of your patients are facing and dealing with. So just make sure you get some balance. Um, when, you, when, when doctors are in a difficult situation, sometimes it can be difficult to see a way out, particularly if, if you're, say, a doctor dealing with like a, you know, a stressful, like the pandemic, like COVID-19 at the moment. When you've been in a challenging situation like you were with the cave rescue, what do you think helped you see that there was a way out and that there was a solution? I really find in these sort of complex um, situations, <coughs> it's really just a matter of just one foot in front of another, just deal with the one patient in front of you at the time, just one step at a time. Don't try and look ahead too far because it can just seem overwhelming. So just deal with what you, what's right in front of you at the time, I think is, is the best way forward. Um, just, just keep it simple and in the moment. Uh, don't get overwhelmed by the big picture. Other doctors might find themselves in the media spotlight, probably not as intensely as you did with the world's media focused on you, but what advice would you have to other doctors who might find themselves uh, in, the, in the gaze of the, the media? Uh, well, firstly, I offer my condolences if that is the case, because um, it was not something that I, I sought out and uh, I found it pretty traumatic to start with. But once I realised there was no escape, then, um, I, well, first of all, I did realise that the media is your friend as long as you haven't done anything uh, too controversial. So, you know, as long as you're on the side of, of the righteous, then, then the media are excellent to deal with. And I think my advice would just, just to be yourself and don't try and be uh, something that you're not. Um, be careful with your answers. Think about what you're saying. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, practice makes perfect. And, you know, I feel like I've got a long way to go, but it's uh, it, certainly more exposure does make you more comfortable with, with dealing with the media. You were part of a large team working under, you know, intense pressure and scrutiny with the eyes of the world on you. What, what are your reflections about how well that team worked? We really stayed as an autonomous group within the, within the cave diving team. And within that group, we had a, a very loose, you know, command structure. Obviously, we were just a, a, a bunch of guys who knew each other either personally or by reputation, by and large. And there was an enormous amount of respect within that team for each other's previous achievements and accomplishments. So there was no ego or chest beating. We all just kind of got on with the job. Um, there were some robust discussions about the best way to you know, affect this plan. But at the end of the day, um, we all managed to get on the same page pretty quickly. It was, it was an amazing group actually. And uh, the sense of cooperation and, and purpose was extraordinary. So it was great to be a part of. How, how important do you think it is that doctors have that sense of purpose to, in, what, in what they do? Oh, it's, I think it's everything. You, you have to keep the patient first and foremost in, in everything you do. And the team you work with all has to ha share that common goal, which by and large we do. You know, this concept of teaming is something that interests me where people are brought together uh, very suddenly to work on a project. It's a, it's a, a term that's used more and more in business, I believe. Um, and never was it more evident to me in Thailand that this disparate group of people from all around the world were brought together for this common goal. And the goal was crystal clear, get 12 boys and their coach out of the back of this cave. So, um, you know, when you've got such a clear and common purpose, then working as a team becomes much easier. And we see that in the hospitals all the time with, with um, you know, emergency teams being brought together for a trauma or a cardiac arrest. You know, you might not have ever met that nurse or that surgeon before or that, that do other doctor, but you all know why, why you're there. You're all playing off the, the same um, song sheet because you all know the recipe, if you like. And, and so that, that sort of teaming works very well in those situations. What was your message to, to people, not just doctors, but to people about the importance of um, going outside your comfort zone so that you can 
not only grow as a person but be able to deal with whatever life throws at you? Why is that so important? I think to just become more robust and resilient, it's important to constantly challenge yourself. For, for me, that means going on outdoor adventures uh, to do things that that are uncomfortable or that frighten me a little bit. And I usually come back from these expeditions that I go on feeling very pleased with with the fact that I've survived or endured some some hardship. And, you know, when I'm at work uh, a week later and I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm struggling or, or I'm challenged by this, I reflect back to what I achieved out in the bush a couple of weeks ago and, and push myself through discomfort or hardship and thought, no, I can I can do this because if I can survive that, I can definitely get through this day in this nice air-conditioned hospital. Um, I just think all, all aspects of our life where we, where, we, where we challenge ourselves make us more resilient. So, you know, don't shy away from the hard things. Don't shy away from the hard choices. Um, for some people, including myself in the past, it's been things like public speaking that have, have been, you know, frightening. And so by in, by going out of your way to do that, you very quickly, you know, overcome the, those sort of concerns. Um, just do the hard things and, and you'll be better for it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and um, you know, it's been great chatting with you and congratulations and keep up all the great work.